Most of us remember the election of David Harris as ASSU president in 1966 on a radical platform calling for student control of student regulations, equal rights for men and women students, and an end to university cooperation with the war. David was an honor student in social thought and institutions, a winner of the Stanford Poetry Prize, and a clerk at Kepler's Books. David became an organizer in the draft resistance movement, refusing to cooperate with military conscription. He was ordered to report for military duty in January 1968, refused and was indicted on felony charges. He married Joan Baez in March 1968 while out on bail. Tried and convicted in May, he was sentenced to three years in federal prison, of which he served 20 months, 12 in maximum security. He was paroled in March 1971. For the past 35 years, David has been a journalist and author, reporting stories throughout the United States, as well as in Central and South America, Europe, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. He's a former contributing editor at the New York Times Magazine and Rolling Stone. His work has covered a wide range of subjects, from professional football to presidential elections to the Kurdish diaspora. He's the author of 10 nonfiction books and one novel. One of his books is of particular interest to many of us, Dreams Die Hard, Three Men's Journey Through the 60s, a story built around the 1980 murder of former Congressman Allard Lowenstein by Stanford student and former civil rights activist Dennis Sweeney. David has raised two children, Gabriel and Sophie, and has a five-year-old granddaughter. He's played in a lot of pickup basketball games, belongs to a local peace group, is an original member of the Global Business Network and a practicing Tibetan Buddhist. He has lived in Mill Valley for the last 25 years. Welcome, David. Welcome back, David. <laughs> well, I guess I don't need to tell you, 40 years is a long time. <laughs> In the time since, of course, I've been to prison and out on parole and been expelled from the country of South Vietnam right before it ceased being a country. Um, run for Congress, won uh, a primary election, lost a general, uh, and spent uh, 35 years as a working journalist um, and uh, managed to raise two kids. I've owned the same house in Mill Valley for the last 25 years. Uh, my first mortgage was 12.5% and I've been refinancing ever since. Uh, um, I've, uh, of course, raised two kids and, and uh, found Buddha and, and uh, blown out my knee and lost some of my teeth and most of my hair. Uh, and uh, I've uh, buried my parents, uh, one of my wives, and uh, two of my best friends. And now I'm a grandfather with a pacemaker uh, who can't read without magnifiers and uh, still don't ha am 15 incomplete units short of my Stanford degree. Uh, <laughs> uh, nonetheless, uh, at age 63, I am still identified as Stanford's radical student body president. <laughs> which, of course, is all right by me. Uh, there's nothing that happened back there that I was involved in that I'm not proud of, and, and uh, I've included it on all my resumes ever since and continue to do so today. So I have no problems coming tonight and talking about the good old days, as it were. Uh, and uh, we've all reached the point where the issue of legacy suddenly has a kind of reality that it never had before. And I'd like to talk about that uh, tonight. Um, Jeannie found a title for my speech, 1969 Stanford in the World, and I have to warn you ahead of time that I probably will hit on Stanford in the World, but uh, I'm gonna leave 1969 pretty much alone, uh, having followed the kind of river of emails that have been flowing around this reunion. I've noticed first thing off that everybody else's 1969 looked a lot different than my 1969, so I'm probably not the one to explore that year. Uh, I never knew Richard Lyman, or if I did, I can't remember him. Uh, so uh, uh, although I did read his 
article in Stanford Magazine and uh, uh, am familiar with some of the events that he was whining about, but I'm certainly not the one to try and explore those. There is far more knowledge in this room about that than I'm ever going to have. But uh, instead, uh, you know, I spent 1969 being a convict. Uh, in 1970 and 1971, which is a whole different story than 1969 here. So instead of talking about 1969, I really want to talk about the 60s in capital letters, you know, that kind of thing that uh, hangs out there in the great s summaries of history that, that our culture operates around, that uh, have uh, uh, developed through the media and through historians and, and uh, um, have become a kind of shorthand symbol that, uh, like it or not, uh, all that energy and time we spent, uh, we uh, are saddled with that version of it. And, uh, you know, I would like to address that. It's, of course, a familiar task for me. Uh, one of the chores of being perpetual student body president is that every time something happens that that somebody thinks looks like the 60s, I get a phone call and a film crew out of my front lawn to uh, <laughs> explain why this demonstration is like all those other demonstrations or something similar. Um, and, you know, I must confess ahead of time that, that I understand that notions like the 60s are really an artifice. I mean, there is no way to sum up the experience of hundreds of thousands of people operating over 10 years, it's, it, uh, it is always going to be some kind of distortion. That said, of course, uh, the prevailing distortion is one that I have little use for. Um, we are, if not summarized under sex, drugs, and rock and roll, are this kind of vacant uh, aberration of uh, stampede of black sheep that uh, uh, has supposedly no relevance to the modern world and, uh, and has whatever good memories there were out there of us have uh, been under assault for the last 30 years from a succession of Republican administrations uh, who have even gone so far as to start about uh, six wars or invasions in order to free America of the dreaded syndrome that we left them with uh, that somehow didn't want to fight those six invasions and wars, whatever they came up with. And uh, now, since they finally have succeeded and made America safe for war criminals and, uh, and torturers again, uh, I think uh, it's time for us to reassert a little different take on the subject than the, the one that is in common usage. So I'd like to spend my time doing that tonight. Um, it's uh, given that all the efforts to stamp us out have finally led the country into moral and financial bankruptcy, it's probably a fortuitous moment for us to talk about what really happened back then. And uh, when I'm doing that, I will, you'll see, use the first person plural and talk about we. And I'll confess ahead of time, that too is an artifice. Of course, uh, uh, there's no way that I can stand up here as the representative voice of hundreds of thousands of people, nor do I want to pretend to. Uh, but the we I have in mind is what we used to call the movement. Uh, you remember well that noun that was really a verb chasing a bunch of adverbs and adjectives as best it could. Uh, that had no membership cards and no real proof of existence except every now and then the ground shuddered and it rose up and all of us identified with it and uh, in the end it turned out to be an extremely powerful political force even if it didn't know what it was most of the time it was doing it. And uh, uh, So when I talk about we understand it as poetic license uh, I'm not trying to, to uh, seize control over anybody's memories or versions of events, but rather find some way to try and capture what we were about back then and portray it as best I can. 
So what really did happen back then? I mean, what is the thing that needs to be passed on to the rest of America who didn't live through that and wasn't part of it? And uh, what were the things that we made different? And when I thought on that, I came up with four big ones. The first was that we purged the residues of slavery. You know, the movement for me began in 1963 in the fall when I came here as a freshman. And a month after uh, uh, I began my classes, there was a uh, campus-wide meeting in Wilbur Hall and uh, where it was announced that uh, a bunch of black students in Mississippi had been uh, fighting Jim Crow and they wanted some white students to come down and help them. And uh, from that point on, uh, for me, there was no looking back until uh, more than 10 years later. And as you remember, it was a really different America back then. I came from Fresno. Uh, the town I grew up in, there was not a black person who lived on the east side of the Santa Fe Railroad tracks. And that was California. South of the Mason-Dixon line, it was horrific. Uh, there were separate waiting rooms, there were separate bathrooms, there were separate drinking fountains, there were separate dining facilities. Uh, there were no right to vote if you were black, uh, no equal protection under the law, no trial by your peers, no right to the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Uh, and all that was enforced with lynchings and terror and abuse and, of course, poverty. And challenges were not accepted. I remember uh, the third day I was in Mississippi with SNCC, uh, I was standing on a street corner in a place called Lambert, Mississippi. And uh, at that uh, point, I was there with the three other civil rights workers. And, the three of them had decided to go to the post office, and so they went off and left me standing by the car. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, a pickup truck pulls up, and out comes two white men, one with a shotgun, the other one with a pistol. And the guy with the shotgun puts it about that far from my nose and says, nigger lover, I'm giving you five minutes. Get out of town before I blow your head off. That's the way it was back then. And it wasn't just in Mississippi. Uh, when one of the uh, Stanford students on the project I was working on was beaten up and the story got in the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, the next day the FBI was dispatched to investigate this. And uh, I happened to answer the door when the FBI agent knocked. It was my first contact ever face to face with the FBI. And uh, he flashed his identification to me and said, well, what's the problem, nigger lover? And, at that point, I knew we were in really deep. And when I finally got back to Stanford after that trip, of course, the first visit I got was from the Stanford FBI, who proceeded to take me in and, no lie, put me under the hot lamp, you know, just like in the movies. Uh, so that's the way it was back then. And even if challenges weren't allowed, they were continued to be made with a kind of ferocious courage that I can only still, looking back, marvel at. The symbol for me uh, was a black woman in uh, Quitman County, where I worked, uh, 75 years old, went down to the Registrar of Voters office, demanded to register to vote. They arrested her, threw her in jail, tortured her in jail with an electric cattle prod, finally released her, and she walked out the front door of the jail, walked down the street to the Registrar of Voters office, walked in and said, I want to register. It was that kind of incredible courage uh, and vitality and commitment that I think set the tone for the whole decade. And uh, it certainly did for me, and I think it did for the country. And that relentless insistence and the merger of a bunch of students who had never experienced anything close to oppression with uh, people who had never experienced anything but oppression. Uh, and that alliance in the f made the final push that killed Jim Crow. 
and struck a bro against racism that uh, if it didn't kill it, it certainly set it back. Uh, and we were able to force the issue of race onto America's front porch where it couldn't be ignored. And in the end, only the 1860s were more important to the struggle for freedom in this country than the 1960s. And that struggle was not made by proper people. That struggle was made by troublemakers, made by outside agitators, made by freedom riders, made by militants, made by people who were not uh, supposed to be doing what they did, but they did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. And today, there would be no black man in the White House who wasn't a butler if it weren't for what we did 40 years ago. And there is nothing that I am more proud of than that contribution. And there is certainly nothing more noble or more gratifying. So if you're going to ignore the 60s, you're going to ignore perhaps a biggest turning point in American history, uh, certainly in our lifetimes, on that front. Second thing I came up with was a far more local phenomenon, which is, you know, we managed to vitalize Stanford University. Uh, we forced it closer to being a genuine community of scholars than it had ever been before. Uh, you know, when I arrived at Stanford, uh, much like you, it was assumed that students were kind of empty vessels to be filled uh, at the uh, administration's pleasure. Uh, in loco parentis was the rule. If you were uh, a young man and you stayed out all night uh, with your girlfriend, nothing happened to you. If you were a woman and stayed out all night with your boyfriend, you were expelled from school. You know, when I read that Lyman article, probably the thing that annoyed me as much as anything about it was his statement that uh, somehow all these changes that happened at Stanford were inevitable and that, that, uh, that somehow we, we had nothing to do with that process. And it doesn't jive with my memory. I remember sitting on the Committee of 15, as it was called in those days, five students, five faculty members, five administrators, spending hour after hour after hour trying to convince one of the faculty members or one of the administrators to change their vote uh, and allow women to have the same rights on campus that men had on campus, uh, only to be told that if this were going to happen, uh, the next inevitable step was sexual intercourse. Uh, and I had uh, the duty, anyway, of explaining to them that that horse was already out of the barn <laughs> and that they better find a new excuse. Uh, I never met with Richard Lyman. My president I used to meet with was Wallace Sterling. And I can remember spending long hours explaining to Wallace Sterling that that uh, the university's pursuit of truth carried with it a kind of value system that ought to make it uh, unthinkable for it to cooperate with the war effort. And he responding by telling me exactly how much money I had cost the university that month in contributions. Uh, parenthetically, in the years since, whenever approached by Stanford for a contribution, I explained to them that I just gave a million dollars by not being student body president. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I remember my one meeting with the Board of Trustees where I argued faithfully that the students ought to have an equal footing with all the other parts of the Stanford community when it came to making decisions on campus only to be uprated for having come to the meeting in a work shirt. Uh, so if it didn't smell like inevitability where I was. Uh, and certainly Stanford is a better school today than it was when we were there. Uh, there are now co-ed dorms. There is now equal rights. There are a plethora of courses and majors that never existed 
uh, until we, of course, insisted on the right to start designing them. Uh, and uh, there's even a, a policy, it seems, of keeping their distance from the Department of Defense, certainly much more than they did in, in, in our day. But to call that inevitable is, uh, of course, face-saving by the powers that be. The truth was that none of this would have happened were it not for uh, another group of misfits and outcasts and, and uh, uh, agitators who insisted that uh, Stanford grow up and wouldn't settle for anything less. That it is now the Harvard of the West and no longer the finishing school for California's rich uh, owes no small measure of uh, credit to, to us and what we did. And we should not be bashful about claiming that. The third area I came up with was really about the larger culture of America and the transformation that our decade brought to it. You know, the America that I grew up in, uh, in the 1950s, was a really singular place, uh, monochromatic in every sense of the word. You know, it was a, a land without options. I mean, if you were a young man growing up in Fresno, then your choices were to be John Wayne, or John Wayne, or John Wayne. And of course, for women, the choices were even narrower than that. And uh, there was a kind of religious ferocity to the normalcy of America. And to step outside that normalcy was considered uh, a potential felony, at least. And certainly grounds for ostracism on all fronts. I remember uh, my freshman year in Wilbur Hall, one of my good friends uh, was uh, uh, Peter Kalkinen, who was, uh, I think, certifiably Stanford's first long hair, who showed up in the fall of 1963 with hair that came down onto his shoulders, something that nobody had ever seen on a man before. Uh, and I remember about two months after the, the fall quarter started, uh, being barricaded in Peter's room, uh, trying everything we could to keep the door from being forced open by the freshman football team who, of course, wanted to get Peter's hair. Uh, fortunately, we won that battle, but, of course, I lost my own to the same football players two years later. But uh, it was uh, a kind of narrow-mindedness that really ran the store that was uh, not simply annoying, it was also stifling. And, uh, uh, that it changed was due to us. They called it the counterculture in those days, as you remember, but uh, that really doesn't capture it, uh, the, at least the scope of it. Uh, um, we really introduced the idea to America that identities were something you could choose rather than having them issued to you. Uh, and out of that very simple cultural proposition came a whole era of spiritual discovery and social experimentation, self-examination, sexual liberation, intentional communities, artistic exploration, communal imagination, and just simple variety. And as a consequence of that cultural statement, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and all of the rest of it, uh, Americans became more tolerant and more creative and more spontaneous, multicultural, and independent and aware. Uh, it, nobody did this intentionally, but we all had a little piece of that action. And the end result was that the paradigm of uniformity that we were all born into died. And it was replaced by choices and options, maybe by now to such a degree that it's all those choices are a dilemma. Certainly uh, uh, the paradigm for us was how to fill in all the blank spots because there weren't, there was nothing in all that blank space. The, 
The problem today, of course, is how do you choose between all of those options, which is a very different kind of paradigm to struggle with. But let me say that it's a far better one to struggle with than the one that we had to struggle with. Uh, uh, too much is, is, is far preferable to too little. And uh, that it, we went from too little to too much uh, is, uh, uh, again, to our credit. Uh, generations of Americans have had more meaningful lives because we did things like the Free University of Palo Alto and, uh, and uh, B-ins and uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And uh, it wasn't all lighthearted. It had extremely real consequences. And those consequences made us a better country. And finally, of course, is the war. I mean, I still can't say those words without a tremor. Uh, you know, my heart goes right to that place in my chest where my outrage lives, and uh, always will. This was not a question of policy. This was a crime whose enormity was stunning. Uh, this was a struggle over the very soul of the United States of America, pitting us, a bunch of 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 year olds who didn't know any better against the most powerful institution in the world, the United States government. And that we struggled with them uh, was heroic. You know, this war started with a lie, was pursued with colossal arrogance in violation of everything that the United States of America was supposed to stand for, from day one to day 4,850. Uh, it was a violation of all the precedents that had been set at the Nuremberg war crimes trials. Every one of them, there was torture, there was carpet bombing, there was forcible relocation of civilian populations. There were chemical weapons. There were concentration camps. Pillage as a matter of policy and strategy and generating millions upon millions of refugees. Defending a government that had no claim to existence other than American fiat and none of us would have accepted for 15 seconds as a dog catcher. And when it ended, Two million people were dead for no good reason. This is not something anybody gets to forget. And nor should we allow this country to forget what that was. Uh, it, there is no good side to it. You know, in the intervening years, uh, we have been able to kind of shove it under the rug uh, as a mistake. Uh, which is a convenient one because, uh, you know, you can be a mistake because we didn't level Hanoi when we had the chance, or it can be a mistake because it was a war crime. There's a whole wide range. Everybody gets to grab it and nobody has to talk about it. But mistake does not get it. Uh, it's a mistake to uh, uh, wear brown shoes with a black suit. You know, it's a mistake to leave the oven on when you leave the house. You know, it's a mistake to, to forget your jack when your car go, tire goes flat. Killing two million people for no good reason does not fit in those categories. And never will. And as long as we try to fit it into those categories, we're going to insist upon repeating it and repeating it and repeating it, as we have now witnessed in our old age. Uh, those ghosts come back to haunt always. And those, these ones will. And when we stood up against it, of course, we were reviled and sometimes suspended, expelled, arrested, imprisoned. And we persisted nonetheless. And because of that persistence, we made it impossible for the government to continue its policy. Uh, we changed the minds 
of hundreds of thousands of our fellow citizens because of our willingness to stand up and take risks and step out of the normal pattern. And in so doing, we really reintroduced conscience to American politics. Uh, we dismantled conscription. We identified that American urge to empire and called it into question. We pointed out that in that equation of my country, right or wrong, wrong was a very real possibility. And when wrong happened, it was every citizen's obligation to rectify it, whether it was ours or somebody else's duty. It was, had to be done. Uh, and it's certainly hard for Dick Cheney to accept, but the fact is that when democracy was at stake, we stood up. When crimes were being committed, we spoke up. When the country was in grave moral peril, we saved it, at least for the moment, from itself. And we deserved far better treatment in the history books than we have been given thus far. You know, about five years after the war ended, I uh, was called to, the, to a Senate committee to testify when they were considering pardons for people like myself. What I told them was that I wouldn't take a pardon, but I would accept an apology. <laughs> My position is unchanged. describe what lessons could be learned from that experience. And uh, so I've searched my mind about, you know, what, uh, what I would say. And it's not about all the details of policy issues. Uh, uh, it's really, uh, I imagined it as the list of things I wished I had, someone had s snuck under my door when I was in 1963 as a freshman in Wilbur Hall. Uh, but I came up with, with, with six that are really about the process of uh, doing things like what we did. The first one is that uh, evil is banal. Just like Hannah Arendt said, it is the well-intentioned who are the greatest dangers. Uh, all of the evil that any of us have experienced has been by and large done by people who went home to their families at night and loved their children and, and petted their dogs. Uh, it, uh, we cannot spend our time looking at the for the stereotype because it's not the stereotype that is the danger to us. The danger to us is the normal who have no perspective. Second, no one is powerless. You know, that uh, societies are really participatory. And as such, there is an opening for everybody to have power of some sort or another. And in life, everybody has a constituency. You know, for every person, there are 10 people watching him trying to figure out what to do with their life as well. And in that constituency, there is power as well. So that we never need to accept the myth that there is nothing we can do. It may not be sufficient, but it is available. The third is that responsibility is both universal and unavoidable. You know, there was that myth amongst our generation that somehow if you didn't uh, do anything or you didn't involve yourself in these issues, that that made you neutral. There is no such thing as neutral. Uh, Staying neutral is a decision, and it always endorses the status quo. And responsibility is there. And whether you want it to be there or not, whether you are involved or not, whether uh, uh, you choose it or not, we are all responsible. The only issue is whether we live up to that responsibility or whether we try to hide from it. Fourth. Politics is personal. You know, uh, 
beyond issues of strategy, beyond issues of policy, uh, at its very core, what is involved is making a decision about who you want to be and carrying that decision out. We find ourselves in that process. Certainly that was true for me and true for everybody I knew back in those days. Uh, we were all trying to figure out what kind of people to be and the one thing we had landed on is that we didn't want to be the kind of people who stood idly by while villages were incinerated and people uh, were slain left and right for no good reason. That was an incredibly important decision. You know, at the time, I used to say, well, you know, when I get to be 60 years old, uh, I want to be able to look back and feel comfortable about what I did. And I'm looking back and I feel really comfortable. Uh, and uh, I'm comfortable with the person I became to do this. I'm comfortable with the persons my friends became when they did it. And uh, I'm still comfortable. And I think that is part of our legacy to pass on. You don't lose by being real. By being the person you have in mind, there is no way to lose. Uh, they can lock you up. They can expel you. They can do whatever they do. You're the winner because you got you. Fifth, it's just the simple understanding that people change. You know, it really happens. People really do change. And that whole decade we saw it. We started as groups of 10, and then groups of 50, and then groups of 100 and then groups of 500, and then groups of 1,000, and then groups of 10,000, and then groups of 100,000. And all that happened not because those people had all been with us from the beginning, far from it. They happened because they, just like us, came to terms and became different. And it is a message of hope. People, one of the magnificent things about people is that they do change and can change and have that power to do so and that we don't lose by invoking that and pursuing it. And finally, you know, you get what you do. You don't get what you talk about. You don't get your ideology. You don't get your rhetoric. What you get is what you do. And we learned a lot of that the hard way, but it is true. Uh, ends are simply means in motion. And uh, we uh, have to recognize that. And when we do, I think we find an automatic tool. By doing things, we really do bring them into existence. And uh, we did. And I'm incredibly proud of us for that. And, you know, uh, at this age, it would be nice to feel like all this was settled. <laughs> uh, but of course, we know better. Certainly in the immediate moment, uh, the, uh, um, the empire has risen again. Uh, the economy has been pilfered. Uh, all of that stares us in the face every day. But I tell you, the one that worries me is not just that stuff, although certainly I spend a lot of energy trying to deal with that. But the one that worries me and should worry all of us, I think, is the one over the horizon. Uh, by virtue of what we have done to the atmosphere, uh, we are facing a kind of disruption unlike anything that's ever been imagined in human history. The very survival of the species is up for grabs right now. And uh, we are looking at a level of disruption that will uh, uh, kill civilization as we know it. Serious scientists are saying that the, the world population of seven billion as we start this century, it may be down to one and a half billion by the time we end it. That's beyond imagination. Do you understand what it looks like? for seven billion to go to one billion. Uh, this is a level of pain and suffering uh, that is beyond uh, grasping. Um, you know, we, 
we're looking down the, the barrel of that. And what we're faced with is a necessity to transform beyond anything that any of us did in the 1960s. Uh, we are uh, forced to recognize that everybody on the planet has to make drastic changes in the way they live. I mean, there's no mystery to what those changes are. We're going to have to consume less, share more, stop fighting, and help each other. What we are is uh, uh, the new metaphor for our condition is we're in a lifeboat, all of us. And now, from here on in, if we're going to survive, we're going to have to play the game by lifeboat rules. And uh, that means a level of community and communalness uh, that uh, only seemed visionary up to now. The truth is that unless we are able to become our better selves, those things that have always been held up as ideals in our spiritual and religious traditions, if we are unable to be those better selves, we cannot survive. We cannot pass a world on to our children and grandchildren and their children and on down the line. Suddenly the continuation of the species is up for grabs. And, uh, you know, it's, we have to act over the horizon. The consequences of what we've done are not going to be apparent to us until it's too late to do anything about them. We are the oil tank, the giant oil tanker that has to turn before it sees something in order to avoid it. We are in that position and we need to act on that and we need to build a politics that's able to look over the horizon and make that real and compelling. We have to act together, and I mean all together. Uh, the entire planet has got to be in on this, uh, or it doesn't work. And we can't wait. God knows I didn't ex want this for my old age. But we are blessed with the fact that if there is any group of Americans who's had any history with the notion of transformation, we're it. And time is short, uh, so I think the old folks better pack up their memories and get to the barricades before it's too late. <laughs> Thanks.